So welcome to tonight's or today's Bible study. Um, it's titled, Is God's Divine Love Working Through You? Because this is exactly what God's love is expected to do. It's supposed to pass through us to others. And we're going to see how that happens today. So I've chosen a photograph here that I got or an image that I got off the internet with this young lady here reading about God's love being more than a feeling. So she's reading the word of God and this is how God speaks to us mostly through his word. So um, I thought that that was an appropriate image to use for this Bible study today. So, so um, Christians throughout the ages have often spoken, uh, spoken about God's love and about how he has loved us so much that he gave us his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to, to live and die and rise again for us. And all of that is very true about God's love. However, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians about charity. In fact, he devotes a whole chapter to it. Uh, and charity is another meaning called divine love. And what it represents in very practical terms as to how we are to reflect God's love towards others. So in this he says, and now I'm going to read the whole of 1 Corinthians 13. Um, Pastor, when I've can... when I, when I can... finished, you, you can read it through too. Okay? Okay, all right. Okay, so it says, The most with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind, and charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, meaning that vaunteth means to make a vain display of one's own worth or attainments. It is charity is not puffed up, meaning proud. Charity doth not behave itself unseemly, meaning in an unexpected manner. Charity seeketh not her own, meaning welfare, her own welfare in times of trouble, um, and charity is not easily provoked to jealousy or retaliation. And jealous, and uh, sorry, uh, charity thinketh no evil. So charity rejoiceth not in iniquity, meaning rebellion towards authority, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Where there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. So when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child and thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass, darkly. But then, face to face, now I know in part. But then shall I know even as I am known. And now by the faith, hope and charity, these three... But the greatest of these is charity. Amen. So we're going to, out of all of these scripture verses here, we're going to look at some of the words in uh, detail and what they represent. The words that are in uh, blue here, you'll find the references marked to these because this is what um, um, charity or divine love is um, describes. And so we'll look at these in a little detail here in the list. So I've got a list here of nine ingredients of divine love. 
and these are the Bible references that we've just read up here. So the first one that's listed is divine love is patient, okay, or as patience. Now, it's defined as passive love. It's love that's waiting on the side, okay, and it means that it's without active response or resistance to anything. So it means that there's no hurry to do anything. It may even suffer, um, you know, and have to endure while uh, being passive. Um, it may well bear someone's burdens or bur bear a burden on its own while it's waiting. Um, it believes, obviously, in that something's going to happen and just hopes as well and obviously endures all things while it's in a passive state. Okay, so that is the first one, which is called patience. So the second point here is kindness, which means love in action. And it means engaging or being ready to engage in something. So kindness um, never acts rashly or insolently. So insolently is sort of, in a way, an offensive way. So that's the way kindness is. Kindness is always kind and gentle. It's not inconsistent. and It's not puffed up or proud. That's what uh, kindness is. Kindness always has the other person's welfare at heart. Okay, so this is what divine love, the kindness aspect, aspect of divine love represents. Praise, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So the third... The third aspect of those 13 scripture verses is generosity. And this represents love in competition, meaning how generous can I be to this person so that I can outdo the, the time before when I gave or, you know, extended love to somebody else. So this means striving to gain or to win something. And in essence, it means not envious or jealous of anything else. It's yes. just uh, striving to win or gain something. So that's really what generosity means in these uh, this particular verse. Wonderful. Uh, now, the fourth, the fourth aspect here is hum humility, which means or refers to love in hiding. Anything, anyone who is humble... Um, sometimes they need a little bit of provocation to say something or to, you know, come out and speak their mind. Um, so it is, it does mean to be in the state of being hidden in humility. So it means that there's no parade of what they would like to say, think or do. There's no airs, meaning haven't I done a great job. Um, but what humility does, it does work and then it retires. So in that sense, it's a, um, a you know, a servant type um, attitude to towards okay. divine love. Wonderful, excellent. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So the fifth one here is courtesy. And this means or can be summarized as love in society. This means being in the company of other people and being courteous to them. It it. It does not behave itself unseemly, meaning it's, it's always predictable, never changes. And this is what God's nature is. Um, God plainly states that he changes not. So this is what um, God's love is too. Um, it's always polite. Uh, it's at home with all classes, so there's no racial racism or any of that sort of stuff. And it's never rude or discourteous to anyone. So this is what being courteous means in love in society, meaning a broader, a broader group of people. Now the sixth, uh, the sixth one here is unselfishness, and this is summarised as love in essence. Now, if any uh, the ladies should know that you can buy the essence of something. Um, it's usually a liquid and it's all boiled down and you get to everything is contained in the essence of what remains. So this represents the unique nature or the indispensable quality of something. 
which means that it's never selfish, it's never sour, it's never bitter, and it seeks only the good of others, and it does not retaliate or seek revenge. So this is really what unselfishness means. It means it's always got the um, um, welfare of others in its sights and, and care. And that's what this aspect of divine love is. So, so number seven means that it's, uh, it's a, got a good temper and it, it can be grouped as love in disposition. Disposition means choosing to calm a volatile situation. So if someone enters into an argument and people's voices are getting a bit loud and you never know where it may go to from there, this is where someone may have, a, uh, you know, God's person has a good temper, can walk in there and try and calm the situation down. So this means it's never irritated and it's never resentful to what happens. It's there for a, a higher purpose. Amen. And so um, number eight here is righteousness, which, mean, which can be summarised as love in conduct, meaning the manner in which a person behaves. So in, in our Christian life, it's got to hate sin. It's never glad when others go wrong. Uh, it's always gladdened by the goodness or goodness towards others. It's always slow to expose other people's, um, you know, um, bad ways, let's just say that. And it's always eager to believe the best, always hopeful and always enduring. So that, that again, yes, is a summary of what righteousness as the... Um, aspect of the love of God is to towards others as love and conduct. Okay? For, the, for the last one, uh, sincerity is love in profession. And profession is referred to as an act of declaring that one has a particular feeling or quality. So it means that it's never boastful uh, and conceited. That means it's all focused around itself. Uh, it's never a hypocrite, meaning it says one thing but does something different. It's always honest. It leaves no, Im leaves no impression but what is strictly true. Uh, it's never self-assertive. It does not blaze out in passionate anger nor brood over wrongs. It's always just. It's joyful and truthful and knows how to be silent, full of trust, and always present. So those are the, those are the nine groupings. So God's love operates like light shining through a prism. This is one way I'd like to demonstrate how God's love works through us as his people. So this godly quality of charity is often expressed by God towards each of us, um, towards others in different ways, just as white light passing through a prism is separated into the different colours of the rainbow. In a similar manner, God expects to pass his love through each of his sons and daughters on the earth towards others he is reaching out to on his behalf. He does this in much the same manner as a prism transforms white light from its source into different colours on the other side of the prism. So here, this um, I found this on um, oh, one of them, eBay, whatever, uh, and this here you can see a prism. Now this would be a solid piece of glass. It's got a triangular end. This is the ridge along the top. And the idea is that we uh, it, it lays down on one surface. You shine a white light in from the left. It hits the surface here. And then as it passes through the prism, it, it changes into the different colours of the rainbow. And at an object placed uh, on the other side, you can see this gradient from the reds and the oranges, yellows, greens, blues, 
and violets and reds. So this is the way a prism has always functioned, and this is how the rainbow somewhat works in the sky. However, as a parallel, I've used this as a means of showing how God's love, it is broad in every aspect of every need that we have here on the earth. And if it shines through the Christian down here, um, God may amplify an aspect of his love to come out to reflect um, his love through us to our enemies. Or it might come through us to the poor in our community or the orphans or the widows or the or our neighbours. Love your neighbour as you love yourself and even loving the brethren. So the point here is, is that these different colours in the rainbow, although I've assigned different people in our lives who may well need our God's love, they're representative of colours of the rainbow and maybe their needs that we have to fulfil on behalf of God. So, um, hey. I thought that, yeah, hey, I thought that, that was a good, a good analysis. Praise the Lord. So God requires charity to be real. That's his godly love that he passes through us. He wants it to be real. Now, in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, so this is the first verse, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men, that means in more than one language, and of the tongues of angels, and have not charity, meaning or divine love radiating from me towards others, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, meaning no one will listen to my message because it's just not fit for use. And so the illustrations below demonstrate how God sees us when we do not exhibit charity in the way he exhibits. So here, on the left side here, we've got all these brass instruments on the left and we have all of these wind instruments on the right and even the stringed instruments down here, and it's making a deafening noise. So we've got a, an ear here conducting the orchestra, but it's got an earplug in it because it's so loud. In other words, it's got to have an earplug in there to hear what the, what, what's really being played. So God doesn't. God does not want our love that he passes through us to others to be like sounding brass or over here. These are apparently quiet symbols. So if you bang them fairly hard, they hardly make a noise. So people have got to be able to understand us at the level of um, attention that we're trying to get to them. We don't want everything to be too loud and overbearing and we don't want everything to be too quiet. Amen? Okay, praise the Lord. So the next heading here is what does charity mean overall? So I've started to look at some of the individual words here. Um, so we started off in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, and charity is the Greek word agape, and it means spontaneous and divine love. So if you're extending anything towards uh, another person particularly, um, it's got, got to be general, uh, generally spontaneous, meaning you don't think about it and say, I'll get back to you tomorrow morning. Um, generally, it's, you know, you extend that love where you can. Praise the Lord. And, and in 1 Corinthians 13, it, it says charity, um, it abides in faith, hope and charity. Uh, it's saying that these things that eternally abide, there's faith, hope and divine love. So there's nothing really that much new in that, but I just had to put that in there. And 1 Corinthians 14 uh, says, follow after charity and devise, uh, desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So the three things that we are to do here in this uh, 1 Corinthians 14 is to follow after divine love, covet earnestly the best gifts, and covet prophecy more than speaking and interpreting in tongues. So divine love tops the list there, 
And that's really what I wanted to put that in there for. Amen. Amen. And, and in Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, it says, And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfect perfectness. Now, divine love is to be put on as the outer garment and finishing touch to a well-dressed Christian as he or she might appear in the spiritual realm. After putting on the remaining eight things listed above, we looked at the nine, uh, one is to put on this outer cloak as the bond of perfectness or it could be termed otherwise as a girdle. So looking at that, I searched on the internet today and I found this illustration. It's like a belt that a man would wear around his waist with a buckle here. And in the middle of the buckle, uh, uh, these, these are metal bands that hang down. And as you can see on this soldier here, this is the band that runs around his waist and he has these metal uh, bands that, that um, hang down around his groin area. So it says the leather belt was tied around a wool tunic, connected bronze plates hung from the belt to protect the soldier's groin area. So this is really what um, charity is supposed to be. Charity is supposed to be a garment that's worn on the outside and all the other aspects of our Christian love of, of righteousness, holiness and truth and all these other things are supposed to be inside and underneath but bound together with the girdle. Amen. So uh, just to finish that off here, it says here, the purpose of the girdle or divine love is to cover all the characteristics of Christ in you so as to unite all and bind all together as one. Achieving this state in the spirit represents true perfection. And um, this is, um, so this is the, be ye therefore perfect in Matthew 5. I'll just read this out and then maybe Asma could read it out. It says, ye have heard that it's been said, thou shalt love thy neighbour and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun, the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans love the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans salute their own? So then it says, you've got to be different to all the publicans in your town. You've got to be therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. And you do that through sufferings and persecutions and people hating you. You gather a few enemies together, and so, you know, what's new? So this is how you uh, become perfect as God the Father's imperfect. So um, from Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, uh, there's a command there to put on the new man. So there are nine things that the new man is to put on. So the that's, uh, that's in this uh, and other related uh, books. So the new man means that he is uh, created in righteousness and true holiness, as in Ephesians 4.24. Um, now, I'm going to quote that here, um, but there's a few verses here that we, um, you know, there'll be too much to read out. But this one he's used uh, two or three times. So and it says there that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That's where this comes in. Yeah. Okay, praise the Lord. Now, uh, number two refers to bowls, or bowls of mercies. And it, it, it means from what Paul is saying that ye are not straightened in us 
but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now, that's a funny uh, sentence because it's written in Old English. However, yes. here I'm saying you do not have a narrow place in my affections, meaning if I extend my affections to you, they are unlimited. They come from a direction. However, sometimes people term it the narrow affections are in your hearts. This is what Paul is saying. I'm coming at you with a broad range of affections, but you're only receiving a narrow range of those affections in your heart. Is uh, it so yeah. I want you to repay for my affections towards you as children should as a parent. So what he was saying was, was that the uh, Corinthians were not respecting him as a uh, like an elder or a parent or someone worthy of love and respect. So he said, "Love me as I love you." So that's really what all of that is being, is saying in two Corinthians chapter six. So the word bowels is used figuratively of the seat of affections located within each of us. We all have bowels, if you like, or bowels, where our seat of affections are in the spirit man. Amen? So the aspect of in the new man, right, the, the third one is kindness. Now, we've, we've read uh, that appears in 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Uh, the fourth one is humbleness of mind, which is humility. And meekness is another quality of the new man, okay? This is another quality that we're all supposed to possess. Our Bible says that uh, Moses was the meekest man on earth, and as we know, he was provoked by some very strong-willed Jews to get angry. Um, but he was still classed as the meekest man on earth. Um, at number six here... Is long suffering is an aspect of putting on the new man um, in relation to 1 Corinthians 13 and forbearance. Now, this is a, another uh, word that's not often used today. It means to pause, to delay, um, and forbear with the offense for a while. So, forbearance is something like enduring again. Um, that's another quality of the new man. And forgiveness. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So that is Jesus. So what? One of the all of these here, these eight, reflect the qualities of the new man who was supposed to be in us. But the ninth one is divine love or charity. So that's Amen. really what, what this list. Is doing when we put on the new man. So, so looking at Ephesians 4, verse 24, which has been recorded up here, this one here, um, here the word put on is the word, Greek word in duo, which means to be clothed with. So you've got to be clothed with the new man. The new Christ-like nature must be put on and it must manifest the righteousness and the true holiness of God working through you towards all others. Now, the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, means this is the spirit and nature of God in the renewed man. Okay, so there's a few verses there that refer to the, much the same thing. But I'm trying to say that our man in the prism, which is us in the middle there with God's love shining into us, um, this is really, you can't do it unless you really are the, have the new man who's created in righteousness and true holiness. You know, we can only do it with God's help when he sees that we have the new man uh, as an outer garment. Two Corinthians 13, 4 uses the word charity in it, which is uh, the Greek for agape. And the notes here say it wasn't that a, that a few of the brethren had abounding love or charity towards each other, 
but everyone had it as demonstrated in the verses below. So in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 3, it says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all towards each other aboundeth. So here this is saying that everybody in the Thessalonian church, every one of them had charity and they were abounding in it towards one another. That's a very, that's a very significant description of how the, the Thessalonians loved one another cared for one another, prayed for one another. You know, nobody was lacking in the church. And this is a pat pattern set for us in the modern churches today, and, uh, and very sadly it doesn't exist, not that I've ever found it anyway. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12 says, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one towards another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. So these are very key scripture verses here regarding charity and God's love and how it comes from him and reflects to our brothers and sisters in Christ here in the Thessalonian church. And then in this scripture verse is, it says toward all men. Amen. So. There are nine things that the Apostle Paul was fully known of. Now, in 2 Timothy 3, 10 and 11, it says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine. So these are the things that Paul was uh, fully known for. So he preached his doctrine. He, he demonstrated his manner of life. He also revealed his purposes um, he demonstrated his faith with works. He was obviously long-suffering, especially with the Jews, but the key word here is that he obviously demonstrated the love of God, uh, divine, uh, divine love through himself to others. He demonstrated patience, as we saw before, uh, and he also um, suffered many persecutions and afflictions for the gospel. So this is the this is just um, the the scripture verse here that nine things Paul was known for. And so with the first one where he says my doctrine, that refers to teaching. His manner of life was the conduct in which um, people could view his teachings. So what he preached, he lived. Then he was, uh, his purpose in propagating these things was through all of this. Um, his fourth one was that he had faith in God, faith in God and he had faith in his teachings that they wouldn't fail. Uh, the fifth one was that he was long suffering with those who opposed his teaching. So he's talking about the Jews there. Uh, the sixth one was the charity or divine love that motivated his life. Uh, the, the, seven one, the seventh one was patience in suffering for his teaching. So sometimes because his teachings was a little difficult to understand, he had to persevere and repeat himself many times. So that required a bit of patience in him. And then the eighth one was persecutions that he's endured for Christ and also afflictions as well, uh, usually because of his teachings. Amen. So those, those are the nine things that Paul was fully known for. Amen. So for a summary, I'm saying that God has a number of requirements written in Scripture for his people to attain to in this life. So as to be able to be uh, serve him properly in the next life. So a sample of these is shown below because one of these is charity. So what I'm saying here is the, these bullet points here are the goals that we need to attain to and, and the, the bottom one here is charity. So we've, we've all got to become sinless. That means we've all got to stop sinning, usually a long time ago. You don't really want to be at this level 
of your teaching and of your Christian life and still struggling with sin. Because 1 John 3, 8 says that he that committed sin is of the devil. So anybody yes. who's accommodating sin in their life, they're not a son of God. Amen. Yes. So, Amen. so the, the second bullet point is the they've got to have a love of the truth. And 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10 says, And with all deceitfulness and unrighteousness in them that perish, that's talking with God's people, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So here again, it indicates that salvation is a might, it's not an assurance. Um, so the third one here is righteousness. And 1 John 5, 17 says, all unrighteousness is sin. So we don't want to be in unrighteousness. But the opposite one from 2 Corinthians 9 says, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So yeah. the, the emphasis there is on your righteousness. It's not the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to us at initial salvation. But beyond that, yeah. we've got to add to it our own righteousness, which is the righteousness of God, which we've been taught. So this is what all of this here is about. Uh, another aspect that uh, determines whether we're going to be saved or not is holiness because Hebrews 12 verse 14 says, follow peace with all men and holiness without Amen. which no man will see the Lord. So if we yes. don't have holiness in our lives, well, you won't be up there to see the Lord. Okay, you, you will be classed as unholy. Um, the, the next bullet point is perfection and as we saw before in Matthew 5 verse 48 be therefore yes. perfect as your father in heaven is perfect so Jesus Christ would not tell his people down here to be perfect if it was not achie achievable okay and of course we've got charity down here as the last one and in 1 Corinthians 13 the first two verses it says, though I speak with tongue and men of angels and have not charity, I am nothing, meaning in God's sight, because God is love. In other words, if we have not got any love in us and all we've got is religion and we've got all of our set of beliefs, but there's no love, those will be like a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal because nobody can understand what you're saying. Okay, it's only when you've got love that everything starts to make sense. So in 1 John 4 verse 8, um, this is uh, a clearer word for it. It says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And so we've got, if we can demonstrate the love of God to other people in our lives, well, then that means that we know God and God knows us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, so, so therefore, charity or divine love working from God through individual Christians acts like white life entering a prism and splitting into the colours of the rainbow on the other side of the prism. Amen. God expects his love that he directs towards his people to then reflect his love towards other people. In the diagram below, this means that one's enemies will need a different type of godly love from us than a neighbour might need. And in the chart below, these needs are indicated as different colours. Charity is an essential attribute to every Christian spiritual life. Without charity being evident in the Christian, or this means he or she has no salvation. That's what it is entirely mean so i just wanted to put that uh picture of the prism in your minds again so that if you take anything from this meeting you'll have the picture of the prism and all of the love that you god's expecting you to extend to your various types of neighbors so i just wanted to finish off with um some examples that are in the scriptures so it says, uh, therefore, when you next see an enemy of yours, uh, the Apostle Paul says, feed him. 
because it'll be like heaping coals of hot fire on his head. So there you go. Next time you see your enemy, ask him if he'd like to go over for a hamburger so he can sit down and have a chat. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, when a widow or an orphan comes into your presence, you suppose, uh, the Apostle Paul said, or James, sorry, says, visit them. And I'm saying to inquire how you are able to help them. Now, widows especially need a lot of help, depending upon their age, of course, and any disabilities they may have. But the same goes for, for orphans. So we're supposed to visit the widows and the fatherless in their affliction. And I got many blessings out of doing that when I was younger uh, to w widows in the churches. So th these are practical examples uh, that we need to do. And if one of your Christian friends or a family member has a need of something that you have, you're supposed to give it to them. Now, this Luke uh, 11 talks about a man going to bed and his neighbour um, comes banging on his door and he says, I've just had some visitors turn up and I need five loaves of bread. And the man in the house says, look, go away. I'm now in bed with my children and my wife and, you know, it's too late. Go away. But Jesus said, um, but for his importunity, he will open the door, invite his neighbour in, give him as many loaves of bread as he wants because he loves his neighbour. Okay? Yeah. So, so what I'm saying here is that God's love is demonstrated in these scripture verses where you feed people, you visit people, and you give people what their needs are. Amen? So, Amen. Amen. So in closing, each one who hears this message needs to ensure that they have Christ in you, the hope of glory, so that when people come into your presence, they see Christ in you. That's in Colossians 1.27. So... To end it off, I thought that I would find a picture appropriate with that. And here's a little kitten looking in a mirror and he sees a lion. And um, I figured that, you know, this is the way we're supposed to be when people look at us there and they see Christ in us. Do they see the lion of the tribe of Judah or do they see a little kitten? <laughs> so, amen. That's the uh, end of my presentation tonight. Praise the Lord.